Okay, so we're just about to begin an interview with uh, Larry Hicks. Uh, it is uh, November 30th, 2015. We are in St. John's, uh, uh, Newfoundland, and uh, the interviewer will be William McCray. So we'll just start uh, with a few basic questions. Could you please state your full name? Uh, Larry Gordon Hicks. And your age, please? Uh, 60. And uh, where were you born? In Cornerbrook, Newfoundland. Okay. And as a child, what did your parents do for a living? Uh, my dad was a, an accountant at the uh, paper mill in Cornerbrook, and my mom was a uh, housekeeper. House, house uh, what's the correct word there? Yeah, house, uh, yeah I guess housekeeper. Yeah. Housemaker, house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Housewife. <laughs> and um, what did you do as a child? What were your go-to activities or interests? Uh, played a lot of baseball, a lot of soccer, a lot of downhill skiing. Uh, a lot of table tennis, let's see, oh, yeah. uh, a lot of outdoor stuff, primarily. Okay. Never had video games back uh, when I grew yeah. up, and we only had two channels, so on TV. Lots of sports. Yeah, I was a big skier. I still oh. am. Love, love downhill. Um, were you at any point interested in um, the sciences or maybe exploration or things like that as a, as a child? Uh, that's a that's a good question. Uh, surprisingly, when I was around ten years old, I used to always get my dad to bring me over to the library, and one of the things that used to always do was get take out books on space exploration, and and uh, atlases. And I would take the atlases and take them out for the two week period and bring them home and trace the maps. <laughs> so even at an early stage, I I showed some interest in you know outdoor type things and mapping and and uh, and whatever. So. Well, so. What would you do uh, with those maps? I would just keep, I just keep them yeah. and just basically look at them and look at the place names and where's the highest mountain and the longest river yeah. and, and this type of stuff. So, huh. and and in school, were you uh, also a fan of the sciences or? Uh, well, in in uh, in grade ten, of course, that's when uh, uh, we would get into the sciences in school, do the chemistries and, and physics and, and biology and this type of stuff. I did that for grade 10, but in grade 11, uh, which was my last year of high school uh, at that time, uh, instead of, I wanted to do uh, geology and geography, so I had to drop subjects, so I dropped history and French, mm. so I could take, you know, and do physics, chemistry, geology, and uh, geography. So I guess, you know, it was telling me somewhere that, you know, hey, you kind of like the sciences or the outdoor type related activities versus, you know, sort of more of the the, uh, the, uh, the history the, and, and yeah. languages and, and this type of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, so what, what did you decide to do after high school? Uh, I went to university when I came out of grade 11 in 1972 and uh, I did enrolled in the, uh, in the, the aim was to do an earth science degree. So. Okay. And had you, did you have any idea what uh, specialization you wanted to get into or? Uh, not at that point, no. no. I, I kind of felt first I wanted to get into, uh, I guess, mineral exploration, but then I realized that mineral exploration entailed a lot of being in the bush and maybe gone for long periods of time. And towards the end of my uh, fourth year, and then when I did my uh, honors thesis, I was kind of thinking maybe I might, you know, turn towards petroleum. Okay. So, just because there was less of a... Well, the field work component, and uh, by then I had gotten married, and okay. you know, yeah. children were there, so you didn't want to be gone in the, uh, in the bush all the time. Okay. So, so what would you consider to be your first job after your uh, bachelor's? Uh, my first job was uh, in 1981, and I uh, took a position as senior field assistant uh, working for a, a consultant out of uh, Halifax, a guy by the name of John Leslie. And he had a project with Essex Minerals doing lead zinc exploration in northern Newfoundland. So I got hired on as the senior fuel assistant for that project. And what were the kind of tasks you did? Uh, as uh, primarily, it was mostly uh, soil sampling. I had two juniors assistants working with me, and it was mostly soil sampling. Uh, towards the end of the summer, started to do a bit of field mapping, and then right at the very end, the last couple of weeks, uh, we had a drill came in. I took care of the drill and logged some core and stuff. Okay. So, and uh, where'd you go from there? Maybe tell me a bit about your, your career. Uh, okay. Well, from there, the following, the following year, the year I was finishing off my uh, honors thesis, uh, one of the professors at Memorial, Dr. Noel James, who I think is now with the University of Kingston, 
uh, he recommended myself and another girl in my class uh, for a job with uh, Petro Canada in their research lab up in Calgary for the summer as a summer student. So I took that job in the summer of 82 and I returned in the summer of 83 and, uh, and did basically the same job again and doing primarily uh, sedimentary petrology thin section work on the east coast uh, here, the Venture uh, gas field off Nova Scotia and then some of the Ivernia stuff okay. off uh, Newfoundland. And did you ever do any um, significant work in out, out west? You mentioned just you went to Calgary for a year, but uh, no, all my projects were related to uh, offshore East Coast. Okay. And uh, after I finished with Patrick Canada, actually, I was going to get a uh, permanent job with Patrick Canada. And the uh, right when I was finishing up that summer term, the government put in the federal government put in a hiring freeze, and the job that I was supposed to get never materialized. So I came back home to Newfoundland and I uh, ended up working uh, offshore on the oil rigs as a formation evaluation geologist. What, what would, uh, what would the, that kind of geologist do on the rig? Primarily what you're doing there is you had a, a I guess a sample catcher that went out, caught the, uh, the, the sample at every five meter interval from the drilling and you would bring that in and you would do the geology on that particular sample. So you'd do a hydrocarbon okay. evaluation plus you'd describe the actual drill cuttings themselves and uh, basically uh, log all that and at the end of the day you'd produce a strip log or a lithology log off the complete well section, you know, as you're drilling, right? Yeah, on yeah. a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. And then write the final well report for the, for the uh, geology related stuff. Okay. And that was still with, uh, that wasn't with... That was a company yeah. called Xlog. Okay. So, and I was with them from fall of 1984 up to the spring of 1987, and we had a fire on the rig. I was on the Bow Drill 3, actually. We had a fire. We got evacuated from the rig, and when I came into shore here, I said, I think I've had enough of this. I think it's time to look elsewhere for a job. Anybody and, uh, uh, die on that? No, 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 no. They had to evacuate all the non-essential personnel, so I was one of the ones just being, you know, a service company. Okay. You're one of the first to go. So, but uh, when I came back in then to uh, back home to Cornerbrook, um, uh, Hope Brook had just opened the gold mine in southwestern Newfoundland. So I contacted the company that had found that BP Minerals to see if there was any jobs there, and they said there was no jobs on the uh, on the on the uh, mine site itself but uh, our exploration department may have some work. So I contacted their exploration department and the guy, uh, uh, Dr. Jeff Thurlow, he had said that there's no work at the moment, but he said, uh, you know, we do require people that can draft maps for us, so would you be interested in even doing some part-time work? And I said, sure, why not? And uh, so I took the initiative and uh, to actually do a page of drafting off a 100 meter section of lithology log like I was doing offshore and I brought that into him on a uh, on a Monday morning because I had been speaking to him on Friday so mm -hmm. I brought that in for him on Monday and I said Jeff you were talking about drafting I said here's a sample of what I can do and he was you know impressed with that and two days later uh, one of his senior field assistants quit and we had just come in and seen him I had shown that initiative to bring in that drafting uh -huh. he phoned me and he said Larry I got a job for you if you want it so I started then with BP Minerals for that summer, and I went back on the rigs in the winter, and I worked with BP the following summer, back on the rigs that winter, back with BP the following summer, and then the college in Stephenville, College of North Atlantic, were looking for someone to teach the geology as a replacement position for one of the instructors who wanted the leave absence. And uh, anyway, um, I got the job doing that, and that turned into then uh, 11 years at the wow. college. Uh, from teaching geology with the mineral technology program, which was a two-year program, and teaching then two years all the um, high school science curriculum with the adult basic education okay. program. And then we did a year of special projects doing uh, scripts for videos for the adult basic education uh, program on geology. And then we did a project with uh, uh, Innova Multimedia, which was a local Stephenville multimedia company to produce a CD on rocks and minerals for the adult basic education program mm -hmm. as well. So it's sort of like the subject matter expert for that particular CD. Yeah. And then when I finished off that, uh, the guy uh, 
that was teaching geology in the petroleum technology program in St. John's wanted to go on a year of leave, leave of absence. So they asked me, could I come out to St. John's and teach the, the geology for that particular uh, year? And I said, sure, why not? And I came out, and it was petroleum, so it was a little bit different than minerals. And um, but but you had <clears throat> you basically were specialized in that. I, I well, I had the offshore experience yeah. plus the two summers with Petrocan in the research lab, so I had a bit of a petroleum background mm -hmm. anyway. And uh, I wasn't you know up on wireline logging interpretation, but I learned that as as I was going. And uh, so I did that for the one year. And when that job was ending, the government, the ad had come in the paper for the government looking for a senior petroleum geologist for Newfoundland. And I put in the application, I got an interview, and um, they quizzed me for an hour and a half. And <laughs> funny enough, all the questions they asked me were what I had just taught all the students. So I kind of almost, I guess, lucked into the, not lucked into the job, but you know. Uh, it was at the like right fate. spot at yeah. the right time, like you know. Fate. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, and I, I'm still there. I, I started as the senior petroleum geologist, and uh, six or seven years ago, that position switched to manager of petroleum geoscience geology for okay. the government. And if you were, if you were able to describe uh, the job you do, the responsibilities right now, what, uh, what exactly does that entail? Well, I, I guess. In my role, our primary responsibility, of course, we are the regulator for the uh, onshore oil exploration in Western Newfoundland. So we have really very little to do with the offshore, okay. uh, you know, the Ibernian, Terra Nova, and, and, and uh, you know, off, the offshore area. We regulate the onshore, so we oversee everything that happens out there, any drilling that's taking place. We uh, do review the ADWs that the companies would pass in to do the drilling, and we uh, make sure there's no gaps or emissions within these submissions. We look at it from the safety aspect to make sure that everything is up to spec and all the rig inspections are done, this type of thing. We uh, look at the, uh, the geology when the drilling is done and it, the reports come in to us on a daily basis. We have a part to play in that. Uh, another thing. Sorry, do you go out in the field when you inspect all these things? Does someone have to go our, out? Our, uh, the guys that work in our uh, engineering department, they would go out and okay. do the, some of the rig, uh, rig stuff. So, okay. and, the, uh, and when they're doing the testing and stuff for like uh, uh, the cement testing or, or the, the blowout uh, preventer testing and this kind of stuff, when you do all the pressure ops, they okay. go out and make sure they, uh, they witness this and everything is good. So it's not really much to go out and see from a geology point of view, unless they're probably uh, running some core or something. You might go out and just look at the uh, the core. Are there are there any major projects worth mentioning that uh, um, that have come through uh, that you've seen come through the office as uh, working in the Department of Natural Resources? Uh, I'm not sure if you'd call this a project or not, but uh, back in 19 when did this start? In 2005. Uh, out in Western Newfoundland, the uh, local board of trade out there, they wanted to put together a trade show on oil and gas for Western Newfoundland. So they uh, struck up a committee and they had a, a, the, uh, a technical committee and as part of that technical committee, I was on that and one of the things we decided to do uh, as part of the trade show, we would have a one day geology field trip. And so it sort of fell to us, I guess, in the department to actually write the field trip guidebook and to lead that field trip. And we've done that now for, they've had uh, 10 of these symposiums. So we've done that for 10 years and that becomes a major project. It's a month's work. So, you know, whether it's not within the realm of what you're referring to there, I'm not sure, but uh, it anything? is something that is not part of like was written in the job description when we yeah. took the job, but it's just something that, you know, that came into the job after after we got going there. How many people uh, are part of these field trips? Uh, generally, it, it depends on the, uh, on the uh, number of attendees in the conference per year. So some years we've had as low as probably uh, 70 or 80 and upwards to 150. And of course, we take a big coach bus, so the maximum seating capacity is probably 50 people okay. on one of those buses. And there's been years where it's been filled, and there's been years we've had 20 people. Okay. So it varies depending on the state of the industry. And where do you usually head out? Uh, it depends. Uh, it's a one-day field trip, so we have to go somewhere, like it's a 10-hour field trip, 
leaving okay. eight in the morning, getting back six, six thirty in the evening. And so generally we try not to go more than probably two hours drive from the city of Cornerbrook itself. Okay. So that can get us out to say Port of Fort Peninsula to the south and maybe as far as uh, Parsons Pond, uh, Daniels Harbor to the north on the Northern Peninsula. Okay. And we can do a good field trip. Yeah. So. So there's a lot of, um, I mean, obviously there's a lot of um, <coughs> offshore drilling on the East Coast. There's also been talk of um, maybe potential in the west coast of Newfoundland. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Uh, yes. Well, um, basically drilling, drilling started, historically, we think drilling started in western Newfoundland in 1867. That's the first record of a well that we have, which is uh, only, what, eight, eight years behind uh, uh, Colonel Drake's well in uh, in. Um, in Titusville in the, uh, in the U.S., and that was in 1859. And of course, James Miller Williams in 1858 at uh, Oil Springs in Ontario. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, so we think the first well was 1867, but the first modern well was drilled, uh, and when I say modern, I mean a well that was drilled with the benefit of seismic, it was drilled in Western Newfoundland in 1994 and finished in 1995. And that was by Hunt Pan Canadian. Of course, they made that discovery at Garden Hill there at the uh, Port of Port Peninsula. And since then, there's been probably 40 wells that have been drilled. And some of those uh, have uh, probably not got past overburden. And some have not reached their targets. And, but most have. And a lot of those have had some oil and gas shows and stuff, but only one discovery to date, and that's at the Garden Hill well. Okay. Uh, so, I think I got off track from the original question that you asked there. Well, about uh, just about, um, no, kind of, um, about uh, West Coast drilling, or Newfoundland West Coast drilling, mm -hmm. and if that um, is, because um, I mean, there's a big success in the East, and we all know that, and there has been for yes for decades and decades now, but um, if is that um, something that you foresee for the near future, perhaps? Because you, you do say there is there, there, evidence of, of oil there, of yes, petroleum. Yes, there's, there's, there's numerous oil seeps in western Newfoundland. In, there's three sedimentary basins there, the Anacosti, the Bay St. George, and Deer Lake basins. And uh, one is Cambrian Ordovician in age, the Anacosti, and the other two are Carboniferous in age. Three of them have bona fide petroleum systems. We know, you know there's, there's seeps and shows throughout all those basins. Uh, since 1994, as I said earlier, there's been probably around 40 wells, and that's that's probably in the range of 20 odd that are that are actually exploratory wells, and then there's a number of strat test holes and, and this type of stuff. But uh, there have been there have been good shows in some of those wells, and at the present moment, uh, we we've had I guess a lot of the major players uh, pull out of Western Newfoundland, and we had a company uh, called Black Spruce Exploration that came in probably three years ago now, and they either made uh, option agreements or they outright brought out the leases of the companies that were operating in Western Newfoundland. So this company, Black Spruce Exploration, has most of the permits that currently exist except for in the Bay St. George Basin, and those permits are held by InvestCan Canada Limited. Okay. And Black Spruce is, is hoping to drill a well within the next, uh, this is late November, so with Hopefully, the spot well within the next few weeks, actually. Really? So. And and uh, do you have any idea why the many of the major companies backed off from that area? Uh, Western Newfoundland is is is, for the most part, it's it's a hard place to 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 do exploration. Just because of the climate, and it's because yeah. of the the climate, and not only that, but uh, there's no there's no. Uh, you know, equipment base here in Western, in Newfoundland, really, for onshore type drilling. So all the, all the equipment, for the most part, has to come from Alberta, and it's very expensive to get okay. it. So either Alberta or the eastern U.S. Okay. So even just bringing in rigs, usually it's a one-off. They come in on trucks and they leave the province again. So mm -hmm. it's not like the offshore where you got a semi or whatever parked out there in one of the bays until they're ready to, you know, move it out, out on site. Yeah. So... And um, getting back to your to your days as um, uh, teaching, um, what uh, 
Just curious, were there any standout classes or subjects that you taught that you really enjoyed or thought, you know, made made a big impact? Uh, subjects that I enjoyed, I enjoyed them all because they were yeah. all primarily geology related. Uh, I I really enjoyed, I guess, you know, most the ones I liked the most were the field related ones, the uh, geochemical exploration methods, geophysical exploration methods, because we would get out. And uh, what we would do, uh, myself and the other instructor who taught a mining related course, uh, we, we put our labs, our three hour labs, such that he had them, the students in the morning, I had them in the afternoon or vice versa. And what we would do then was be able to run a full day field trip with the students okay. and take them out. And, and uh, this was great from September, say, till the uh, mid October. We could get them out you know, for a full day and then. And when the snow fell, then the mining the guy would take them for the full day and do a mining-related labs with them. So it was great for the, uh, I like that, you could get them out and actually do something. Yeah. You know, you could drive for an hour and still work for four to five hours and then come back. Whereas if you have a three-hour lab slot, you can't really do much. Mm -hmm. so. And that's really, that's often quite, uh, those kinds of activities is re really what gets the students to love a subject yeah. quite often. That's what they'll remember. Yeah. I, I remember the head of the uh, department, uh, my, my first year that I came there, um, he was looking out the window one day from his office and the bus was parked out in front of the building and uh, I was on my way up to get aboard the bus and he called me and he said, Larry, he said, I don't know what you're doing with those students, he said, but I have never in all my years here seen the bus parked in front of the building, the students ready to go on a field trip and they're sitting in the bus 15 minutes before they're ready to go. <laughs> I said, they must be doing something they like out there. And I said, yeah, we're having... We're having a good time, you know, they enjoy it, right? Yeah. So, and I guess if you go at it from the approach that, you know, you, you get them excited about it and, and uh, you know, they will enjoy it and they'll want to go do it. Yeah. So. And have you have had a lot of students uh, go into those fields? Uh, we've had from the Mineral Tech program, which is a two-year pro uh, program, there's been uh, at least two or three of those students that went on and did finish the geology degrees at Mon and then went on and did master's degrees as oh. well. So yeah. I'm quite quite pleased with that. Yeah. To see that. you proud. A bit, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh -huh. um, working uh, with uh, <coughs> students, younger generations as well, but um, but but also, I mean, from having worked in very different um, fields of work, um, you might have an interesting take on this question. But do you believe there's a, a disconnect between? Uh, the general public and the natural resource industry in Canada, and if so, why? Uh, well, I guess to start off, I think yes, there is a disconnect, and uh, the reasons why, I guess they're very varied, but I think a lot of it goes back to the educational component, and most of the general public just don't realize, they just don't have enough basis in geology and earth science and this kind of thing to really understand the connection between rocks, which are for most people pretty boring, <laughs> and, and you know your your digital camera here or your cell phone and or your makeup that you put on your face. And if you can make that connection and make people realize that hey, if it wasn't for petroleum or if it wasn't for mineral exploration, you would not have any of this and you might be able to then get them more or less to, to get away from this uh, not in my backyard yeah. mindset because that's, that's basically what it is. I, I've listened to the, to the uh, fracking debate in Western Newfoundland and uh, you know, for the most part, I mean, I have to remain neutral. I'm, I'm the regulator for the government. I can't say I'm for fracking or I'm against fracking. I have to be totally neutral. But you, know, you go or you, you listen to the to, uh, comes out of the meetings and the questions and this kind of stuff, and it's and it's quite obvious that uh, that uh, there's a lot of fear out there, which I can see why there would be. You're talking about an unknown, and people still don't know, you know, the end result of fracking. So you can say, yeah, it's not it's not dangerous, but we don't know what it's going to be like 20 years from now or 30 years from now, and maybe these frac fluids start returning or whatever, or working their way through faults and fractures. We, we really don't know. And uh, but uh, but most of the people that go to these meetings and they just outright no no fracking and, and you know we don't want oil exploration but they you know in the meantime they're on their cell phones and everything else and they just don't 
I guess, appreciate, you know, that, hey, you know, if it wasn't for minerals or oil, I would not have this cell phone. And so to me, the argument just boils down to it. They just don't want it in their, their backyard, because if not, they're being awful hypocritical. And, you know, just to say that we're against mining or against petroleum uh, or petroleum exploration. So I don't know. So it's do you good, think? It's a good question. <laughs> yeah, a good yeah. question. You know. Yeah, I often ask that one, and um, and yeah, I get different I get different answers. Do you think it's um, so do you think it's something that should be pressed more early on at school in schools, or do you think it's also the industry who doesn't necessarily do, do a good enough job to convey it to the public? Uh, uh, yes, yes, and <laughs> with, with a caveat. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think uh, there certainly needs to be a much larger educational component uh, built into the, the you know, complete system. I do know, uh, just want to pull one out from my past here, back when we were teaching the mineral technology program, uh, we done a little program, two, two things really. We did a little program where we uh, brought in uh, high school students from all over the province and we gave them a five day geology field, trip, a field camp in Stephenville. And as part of that, we taught them the basics of geology and rock and mineral identification. Then we took them on a uh, three-day hike up into the highest point in Newfoundland, the top of the Lewis Hills. And we did some botany stuff with them with the rare plants and then pointed out the geology. It's an ophiolite sequence, so it's part of the Earth's mantle and, and the oceanic crust. So we, you know, we had a great little field trip there. And they had a much greater appreciation of geology when they had done that particular field mm -hmm. trip. And this was for high school students. And another project we did was we did a one-week field trip. And this was in, uh, in conjunction with the federal government, by the way. A one-week field trip where we took teachers on a, on a geology field trip right across the province. And so then they could take that information and bring it back to their students and, and you know, bring that to their classrooms. And that seemed to work out quite well as well for the 12 teachers that actually uh, did that particular program. And it's something that I think the government, federal government should maybe uh, okay invest in a little bit more mm -hmm. you know because I, I went through that one I know I know it worked yeah and I know the teachers really really appreciate it being able to get the exposure for this for sure so, and especially if you look at um, the natural resources I think count for 10% um, uh, of uh, the Canadian economy yes so in a way yeah the it is a good thing for the federal for the federal government to, uh, to educate yeah. them early on not just you know how things work uh, in the natural resource world and how you know a mm -hmm. cell phone comes to exist or a yeah. camera but also uh, the jobs and the opportunities yeah. that can be involved in the natural resources for for a student yeah mm -hmm. you you catch a child at an age of anywhere from six to probably 11 years of age and you introduce them to rocks and minerals and really get them you know interested they'll retain that for the rest of their lives and they'll sort of always have that little appreciation and understanding of, of you know mining and minerals and petroleum i know uh where i live in st john's here i'm on a little cul-de-sac and there's there's two or three families there that have children in that age range and i always make up these little uh, little 18 compartment rock and mineral kits for them right yeah. and there i did one for uh, my neighbor there uh, two years ago and I brought it over at Christmas Eve because I was going to bring their parents over a bottle of wine anyway. And uh, I made the, uh, the little uh, mineral kits and their mother told me after, she said both their children, out of all the Christmas gifts they got for Christmas, when they went back to school in January, that was the thing, when they had show and tell what they got for Christmas, that was the thing they bought, right on. was those rocket mineral kits. And, and not only that family, but the other one on the other side of me as well same thing that's what they brought to school so that told me right there that you know they have kids have an interest in rocks and minerals and I know when we taught the mineral tech we always went to the schools and did the educational component and went to the malls on education week and this kind of stuff and there was always at the rock and mineral the mineral tech table that was always the most interest from yeah. little kids right up to you know 80 year olds and they love it and they you know so you know, you, you, I think, I think there needs to be more of an educational awareness out there for the natural resources. And I think, you know, it will pay big dividends down the road. So. Thanks. Um, on a different topic, um, and I always like to ask this question as well, 
um, and also might differ from the different sectors you worked in, but how present or absent were women throughout your career? And that might have changed as well. Okay. Well, I guess let's start in university. Uh, when I went through university, there was, uh, in my graduating class of 20 odd people, there was three females. And I, I know, now my son just graduated there a few years back with a geology degree and over half his class okay. were females. So in that 30 year frame, yeah. uh, time was, frame. What was 20, female, uh, 20 women out of how many you were, you would in say? In my class, yeah. there was probably, I think in my graduating class, there might have been around 26 people. And some were like 24, 25, 26, and there was three females oh, three. Wow. that graduated. And uh, in my son's grad graduating class, it was probably 20 odd, I'm not sure of the number, but over each day, he did tell me, he said, Dad, over half my class are female. Uh -huh. So it was certainly changed over that period of time. Uh, working uh, in the bush, uh, very seldom that I see females in the bush back when I did my bush work in probably the 80s and the 90s. Uh, Offshore, uh, I can remember on all the rigs I was on, at no point did I ever see more than three or four women on a rig. Back has, in has the that 80s. changed? Uh, yes, that's changed yeah. as well. Because my coworker now at the department, she worked offshore as well, and she said there's you know a fair number, not a lot now, but you know so probably ten or fifteen on some of the rigs versus back when I was there. Yeah, three. So yeah. three, and now at natural resources, over half our staff probably are are female. So. So it certainly changed. Yeah. So it's good, actually. Yeah. So there's a lot of you know what these uh, women in in resources programs and this kind of thing that are really changing the changing mindsets out there. Yeah, so for they're sure. Good, they're good things. There's a, you see different kind of uh, branches too of, of natural resource, I guess, interests that women are are pushing, especially like yeah. uh, the environmental sciences and yeah. uh, yes. sustainability for yeah. mining, all this stuff, oh. which is often pushed by. Uh, by yeah. uh, women now, or even the the biosciences too. Yes. Yeah. Um, this is a, this may seem like a, a mouthful of a question, but uh, no wrong answer. It's really a, an opinion question. But in your in your opinion, are there any people, events, um, inventions, disasters? I mean, we have uh, we have a very famous one. Uh, close to most Newfoundlanders, which was the Ocean Ranger, for example. Um, but anything whatsoever um, that you deem must be mentioned when talking about the natural resource history of our country. So it could be anything. It could be a discovery. It could be a disaster. Like I said, it could be a person. Uh, it could be an invention. Something that you know resonates with you or you think changed um, the natural resources or a section of the natural resources. Well, from, from disasters, I guess, the obvious one is the, the Ocean Ranger. It certainly changed uh, a lot of uh, what took place here in Newfoundland, especially from a safety point of view. There were very, you know, or not, not very few, but the safety uh, climate was a lot different, you know, pre-Ocean uh, Ranger than what, uh, what it was after. And that's sort of the Ocean Ranger disaster set the stage for the current uh, safety standards that we have today. So it was never good to say, no, I know I want to <laughs> watch myself. Um, yeah, so the Ocean Ranger for sure. Uh, from a discovery point of view, uh, obviously Ibernia mm -hmm. was you know, the, the game changer for Newfoundland Labrador. And uh, as we've gone forward in time now, we've, you know, we've had Terra Nova and White Rose and Ebron uh, the new discoveries now in the Flemish Pass, and then the new uh, the new uh, studies done by the uh, the uh, the Bicep Fran Lab and this group uh, showing that you know let's say just the Flemish Pass itself possibly could contain up to 12 billion barrels of recoverable oil and you know 130 or 113 TCF of natural gas in just two percent off our offshore, under two percent actually. So if that's any indication of maybe the endowment that's out there, I mean, I think Newfoundland Labrador has certainly a great, great future yeah. down the road. And uh, yeah, so Discoveries Voices Bay would be another, another discovery there that was a, that's probably going to be a game changer for Labrador. And likewise, prior to that, the uh, iron discoveries in, the, in Western Labrador. Okay. You know, you've had a lot of sort of smaller discoveries, places like Buckins. 
but you know, Brookings itself for a VMS type deposit is world class, and uh, so you, you know can't get around that one. So yeah, thanks. Um, we'll just finish off with a few questions here. <clears throat> This one we can split in half if you'd like, but what are you uh, proudest of in life? And we can say in life and also professionally, career-wise. Well, in life, um, I have a, uh, you know, absolutely darling for a wife. So, start right there. Yeah. I have two, two beautiful children. I have a daughter that's uh, a pharmacist, got her doctorate in pharmacy. And uh, I have a son who just completed his master's in geology. And I have a little granddaughter, so and a son-in-law, <laughs> so I can't forget him. <laughs> so no, families for sure. Uh, very, very proud of my family. And um, for work-related accomplishments, I guess um, probably the one that I'm I'm probably the most proud of is um, back in 1991. The Newfoundland government asked us at the college at the time I was teaching the mm -hmm. uh, geology with the Minnow Tech program would be, be interested in putting together a two-week prospector's training course for the province. So we spent, you know, from January right up to May putting together that particular course in our spare time. And we ran the first course in May and uh, uh, off that year, 1991. And uh, I was lucky enough that uh, myself and the other instructor that helped me, Len Muse, uh, Len helped teach the course for the first nine years and then uh, the mineral technology program unfortunately uh, uh, it died and uh, we, we got laid off from the college and Len went on his way and I went with the uh, out to St. John's doing the petroleum tech for a year and then I went with government but I was lucky enough that the prospectors course kept on going every year and I kept getting asked would I come back and teach the course for two weeks. So I was lucky enough that I was able to teach that course for 24 years mm -hmm. straight. So I really, you know, I, 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 I put together the course and myself and Leonard and I was able to teach it for the 24 years straight. That was sort of from a work related thing. I think that's the thing I'm most, most proud of in my career. So, you know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And uh, last question, <clears throat> if you were to speak in, I mean, you have a lot of experience with that, with uh, the younger folks, the students. So if you were to speak to someone much younger, like a student, uh, what would be the one piece of advice or life lesson you would, be, you would want to give them regarding their futures, their careers? Um, also, I, gave, I, I gave some advice to someone the other day, actually. I'm trying to remember what that was. I think, I think it was... Um, if, if you have the chance to, to go and show someone what you can do without, without being you know, in your face, type, mm -hmm. you know, showing them what you can do, take, take advantage of any opportunity like that. And uh, I'll revert back to the time when I did that sheet of drafting. You know? So if you've got an opportunity, I know one of my students uh, at Mineral Tech one time, uh, the department uh, were looking for a young fella to help in the uh, in the core lab in Pasadena. So it was a bit physical, you know, moving boxes of core and this kind of thing, but they needed a student for the summer. And so the uh, guy at the department had phoned myself, the instructor in Mineral Tech, said, who do you recommend? So I gave him a number of names. And one of those students happened to be in St. John's for the uh, spring break. And he went into the department and looked up the guy that was looking for um, the student, and he told him who he was, and he said, you know, I'm interested in the job for the summer. I just th thought I'd come in and, you know, make contact and, you know, meet you and put a name to the face to of the, the face, name, yeah. this kind of thing. And, and uh, anyway, he got the job. And uh, the guy from the department told me after, he said, yeah, he said, I looked at all the resumes. Some were really, really impressive, but he said, the guy that stood out, he said, was the guy that took the initiative to come in and see me and make that you know, face-to-face -face contact. Mm -hmm. He said, I really thought that was pretty cool. He said, I appreciated it. And he said, I gave him the job. So sometimes, you know, just by doing some of these little things, it can, it can help you. And it can help your, uh, forward your career quite yeah. a bit. Because you never know, you know, what, uh, how people think. Oh, yeah. Right? Now, you know, so a week later, it can give you a job. It could give you a job. Yeah. And, and that job, by me doing that with that that's, uh, drafting, as far as I'm concerned, that job then 
It led me to the job with BP Minerals to do the mineral exploration, and that gave me the experience to get the job teaching the geology with the mineral technology program, because I never had any educational mm -hmm. background courses. And of course, then that led me then uh, indirectly to getting the petroleum job, because I was in the college system and, and, uh, and teaching the petroleum when they were looking for the uh, petroleum geologist. Yeah. So, so you never know, you know what? The, yeah, for sure, just you know, be a go-getter. Yeah, just, you know, but don't don't be you know too pushy. Yeah. <laughs> don't be too pushy. <laughs> For sure. Because that that will turn people off as well, right? Mm -hmm. But if you sort of strike that balance, and uh, you know if you can put your put your name out there any way you can, you don't know, go for it. Absolutely. Right. Even little things like uh, I remember once again with the mineral tech, uh, the students would come out for the CIM conference here in St. John's, and the uh, university students would be here, and when they would have their uh, little little uh, uh, get-togethers, I guess, after the, the public lecture talk up here in the suites, the memorial students would generally have their resumes uh, on paper. And I said to my students, I said, listen, I said, those resumes, you know, people are talking, they'll lay those down on the table, and I said, that's where they're going to stay, and that's where they'll be tomorrow morning. I said, you're better off, I said, taking, making up a business card, put your name on it, mm -hmm. student, you know, uh, mineral technology, Stephenville. I said, make a little resume on the back of the, the card. It doesn't have to be detailed. I said, those cards will go into whoever you're talking to, they'll go into his pocket. So the next morning, you know, he's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. had too many of those, you know, he'll still have those cards, whereas the resume is still going to be on the table in the room up in the suite yeah. in, the, in the hotel. And, and it's, it's probably less of a setting where you want to, you know, be in your that's, face that's about right. a full yep. resume, right? But something with the, just on the curve. Yeah, thanks, forget about there. it, remember yep. it the next and, day. Yeah. yeah, so that, you know, those little, little things that yeah. you need to do, you know, sometimes. Right. You know. Interesting. Well, thank you. Are well, you're quite is, welcome. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, no, I'm, I'm good. I, you know, I'm just really overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, thanks for the time. Well, thank you.